Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of Gather to Grow here with Utbom Zanzi on Twitter Spaces. Uh, my name is Dawn Numdu. I'm your host for the session, and I welcome you, and I hope that you'll enjoy talking to us about all things artificial insemination. This is part two of a session that we kicked off last week, and I've invited some of our guests that were part of the session last week but also some new speakers to come and join and be part of our very insightful and fruitful discussion um, that we'll be having. I'm going to give everyone a chance just to settle in. One of my speakers has already grabbed the mic, Dr. Ma Cindy, who was with us last week and really stole the show with all of his knowledge on this topic. Um, and so we are really happy to have him back again. And then I see Willem is also with us. Willem is also a smallholder farmer. And he's also here just to share some of his experience, you know, with artificial insemination, because I think a big part of what we do um, on this platform is just to learn from, you know, what you've gone through as a farmer and what you can share with others who might not have done it. Some tips, some advice, and it always helps to talk to someone and find out what they have gone through to be able to either, you know, avoid it or share in, in that experience as well. So I'm going to ask my speakers just to give a short introduction of who they are. I think last week we got to know Dr. Masindi a little bit better. But for those who may not have been in last week's session, just to recap, Dr. Masindi, of who you are and exactly what you do at the Agricultural Research Council. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for having me in this platform. Uh, my name is Masindi Papati. I work at the Agriculture Research Council based in Pretoria, Irene. So I'm a researcher. My area of research is on reproduction and physiology in livestock. So I do all the work related to assisted reproductive technologies, such as the synchronization, artificial insemination, pregnancy diagnosis, the ovum pickup, embryo transfer, embryo flushing. So I do more work on the assisted reproductive technologies. So we also focus on the in vitro embryo production the semen collection, oocyte collection, embryo collection, and also do the freezing part, which is known as the cryopology. So in brief, this is what I do at the Agriculture Research Council. Thank you so much. And I think I may have missed the first part of what you were saying in your introduction. My next guest is Willem Needham. I hope I'm saying your surname properly, sir. Just an introduction of who you are, what you do in agriculture, and just more about your journey within the space. Thanks. My name is Willem Needham. We are small holders in the Centurion West area, not too far away from Deepsluit, and we've been here for about 10 years. We own a two-hectare property. We don't do intensive farming, but we try and do things that we do sustainable. So about eight years ago, I got a couple of Jersey cows. These Jersey cows struggled to get inseminated. I think I had, I had three, four different people, including... Irene Agricultural Research Institute here over a period of time. And each time the pregnancy would either terminate or otherwise, you know, it just wouldn't happen. Eventually, somebody told me to contact Dr. Masindi. I did. And he was busy with a research project. And that was about 23 months ago, if I'm correct now, because the, the calves are about 14, 15 months old now. He indicated that he will do this as part of his research with Holstein, uh, with Holstein semen that he's got. And it was a very pleasant experience because they just came out and they followed up and they came and checked if they were successful with the insemination. And if they weren't, they tried it again. Eventually, two of our cows actually bore calves. We only had three. The one cow, I think, was just too old. Great. So you've obviously walked this path with Dr. Masindi and Dr. Masindi's team. And it's really great to, you know, come back from last week's session and have someone join us now who's actually gone through it and share the hands-on step-by-step process and what they have gone through. And it's so great. I always try to have someone in that way also sharing that experience. So it's not just research-based or someone talking from that perspective. So thank you so much for joining us, Willem. And thank you so much, Dr. Masindi, for introducing me to Willem. I have one more guest. Um, she is here. Ms. Makadu, can you please grab the mic and I'll give you just the chance to introduce yourself 
She was very shy. She said she's not going to talk much, but I want to tell her, just ask her rather, to just come on board and just tell us a bit about who she is and also what she does in the agricultural space. So once she does that, I'll give her the platform. But maybe again, Dr. Masundi, if you can just recap for those who may have missed the first part of the session, which was last week, where we gave the introduction to what artificial insemination is. We spoke really around, you know, what it, how it improves, you know, livestock production, not just for smallholder farmers like Willem, but also communal farmers. And so we kind of, you know, got really into that. There were so many areas that we covered. And I want to maybe after your introduction, then touch on the questions that were raised towards from our participants. But maybe just again, a short introduction on artificial insemination and what it is and how farmers can benefit. Thanks. So artificial insemination is a process whereby semen collected from the males being deposited in the body of uterus of the female. So which means we can collect semen from the bowl now and deposit into the cow immediately. Or you can go and purchase semen or you can import semen from anywhere in the country. That semen will be frozen. So you have to defrost it. You have to plow it first. And then after that, you load it in the artificial insemination rod, then deposit it to the reproductive tract of the cow. I've done a lot of artificial insemination uh, throughout the country. I don't know how many cows have been inseminated. So I've done artificial insemination in every province in the country. So the success rate, yes, it does differ from one farmer to another due to different reasons. One of the good things is, especially in the communal area, because they, they struggle to have a a study pool or a well-proven pool or a pool with good genetic makeup. So with the use of artificial insemination, you can able to access any pool that is available or which is on demand or on market much cheaper than buying the life. Price of the pool can range from 30,000 going up depending on the breed and demand of supply. Whereas if you take the route of artificial insemination, uh, the, the frozen semestro, plus or romanas, uh, and rent, so they can, the price will differ, of course, from one breed to another, but it is much affordable and you can able to plan when to breed and when to synchronize and then when you want the animal to calf, you can able to control your breeding program uh, more effectively. Thanks, Dr. Masandi. And then maybe I want to go over to Willem just to get his take on the process that he had to take or where he actually started as a farmer, where was his first point of call when he now opted to practice artificial insemination? Thanks. So the first port of call when we started, obviously we, once you have a cow, especially milk cows that you want to inseminate or fertilize, then you find a, if you're a small farmer, that it is not viable to have a bull because you need a lot of, for a bull to service you. It's just not viable economically to buy a bull to service your cows. Secondly, if you start asking neighbors, etc., etc., then they're all worried about, well, what health program has your cow been on? What vaccinations has she had? What has she had this? Because they are scared. If you bring the cow over to their herd, that she may have some type of disease that can be transmitted to their herd. Similarly, they don't want to bring their bull to your place either because of that reason. And I think lastly, one's got to be careful. I also looked at this. So you've got a Holstein cow. Now you breed it to a Brahman bull just so that she calves and then has milk because that's what you want. You've got a milk cow. You want the milk out of the cow. Yes, you also want the calf, but you've got to be careful that the genetics of the cow and the bull that you breed her to is compatible in the sense that the calf that is born shouldn't be too heavy and so on. I'm not even going to try and intrude on Dr. Masindi's territory here. You've just got to make sure that they're compatible. Then you start looking at artificial insemination and then you find out, okay, well, you know what? Firstly, if you want to do it yourself, you want to try and do it yourself. One of the things that you then find out is that these guys doing the artificial insemination, especially for the dairy farmers, they are geared to do mass insemination. They don't want to come out and, 
You know, so it's some guy sitting in Betong or Frankfurt or wherever, and he wants to charge you his travel fees from Frankfurt and back four or five times during this process. It just becomes incredibly expensive if you don't have a herd of 20, 30, or 100 or 200 cows. Because if you divide that cost by two cows, you might just as well go and buy the milk. And I then spoke to somebody, I know somebody at the Agricultural Research Institute, and they told me to contact Dr. Masindi. I did contact him. At the time, he was doing research. So the costs was even less than negligible because his research was being sponsored. I do not know what the situation is at the moment, whether his research is completed and it's now gone commercial or not. But what I do know is I did use ARC prior to this as well, where I paid, and their fees is very reasonable when I compare it to to the other guys. When I say reasonable, I can put it to you like this. You know, the entire process is maybe 4,000 rands. If you go to a commercial guy, the entire process is going to cost you something like 25 to 30,000 rands because that's just these costs and these travel fees and everything that he includes in his time and everything to come out to you. There isn't many people in Gauteng that does artificial insemination on a commercial basis. Uh There might be some people that do it privately for themselves, but when you ask them to come and do it for you, they decline to do so. Thank you so much, Willem. I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I'm going to maybe just have them jotted down and I'll maybe touch base with you on that. I'm going to give Ms. Makodo a chance to introduce herself and also just tell us a little bit about what she does and then we'll come back to, because I think for me, the important thing is how do more smallholder farmers, developing farmers make use of the services that you've made use of and sort of save on those costs going to the networks that you've maybe gone through as well. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'm Ms. Makodo Elaine. I'm just on my early stage of research in reproduction. I've never done artificial insemination before, but I've only collected semen and analyzed them for their semen quality. And their... So yeah, that's what I do. I'm on my early stages of research in reproduction. I don't have much to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Makado. And I'm really grateful to have another female voice <laughs> speaking. That's why I always, that's why I kind of, you know, advocated for you to at least say something on the topic. So thank you so much, Elaine. I really appreciate that. Dr. Masendi, maybe just um, to comment on what Willem was saying in terms of some of the cost involved and also just how do you then figure out that costing and who to go to depending on, you know, what your need is. If it's someone like Willem who is operating on a much smaller scale, if you're a medium farmer, how does it change and what type of services do you provide in that way? Thanks. When it comes to the cost, so if I've got a fund maybe from the Department of Agriculture or a private sector, so it means all the beneficiary will benefit for free. The project is funded. So you find that at some stage, you find that the project is funded by certain province A, which means people going to benefit are the people on that particular province only, which means they're not going to pay anything. But if the project is national, it means everyone will be able to benefit. So in a case where the project is not funded, although I don't have any funds from anywhere to support what I want to do, it means we have to charge the farmer the amount of the, the transport, the service, the hormones, and also the semen type that we're going to use. So so what we do for the, let's say for the semen straw, so let's say it's looking for anger semen. I would say we don't have it in RC. If we don't have it, then I will source or connect him or her with the suppliers. Then they can send him the quotation. Then he can able to procure the semen straw from them. If it is in Gauteng or wherever, then we can go and collect frozen semen straw on behalf of the farmer because the farmer won't able to have the right equipment. In this regard, we are referring to the liquid nitrogen tank where you have to store the semen straws. So it's our fund because we are a government institution, so our price are just slightly lower compared to the commercial sector. But in most cases, if we are, the project is funded, then the, the farmer do not have to pay in a single set. 
And is there a specific criteria for this, Dr. Masundi? So what do I need to do if I'm a farmer and the support is then available to me? What do I need from my side? So for the last three years, I was funded by the Houghton Department of Agriculture. So which means well, the project was focusing on dairy and beef cattle. So the Department of Agriculture, their extension officer, they are the one who knows their farmers because they are the one who work with these people on a daily basis. But even us, as I said, because we also have a database for the farmer that we work with, we also include them. And also the farmer, if he, he can also approach us direct or the department to say, I hear about this kind of service, may you please also include me to be part of the project and to be done like that. So it is more of the government official who identifies the farmers. They do almost 95% of the farm that we serve, they are, they are identified by them. As we do, as of manners, five percent. Because if the project is funded by Western Cape Department of Agriculture, I don't know many farmers that side, so I have to rely fully on the officials on that particular province. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Masindi. And now I want to maybe just go back to some of the you know final talking points that we almost crammed into the, the session last week, and there was one comment from one of the participants that was specifically asking about goats. And I know that you had briefly responded to this and specifically talking about goats, but also just in general in terms of, you know, small stock and the average price of an embryo transfer for small stock and the costing around that, Dr. Masindi. My area of specialization is on cattle. So I don't do much in pigs, sheep, goats, and uh, chicken. But I do assist. I didn't operate on the large scale. So the price for embryos for goats or sheep, I will lie to you if I can tell the exact price. But there's a company called Remsem. They are based in Bluefontein. So those are the experts when you come to the small stroke biotechnologies aspect. They are the ones that can able to provide in the list and the, all the costing and all the processes that need to be done. Thanks, Dr. Masendi. Well, I maybe want to bring you back into the conversation just in terms of how you've monitored the process since you've started working with Dr. Masendi and how much you benefited from it and some of the things that you picked up on, you know, through working with the ARC and this entire process. Maybe you can start with some of the positive parts and then maybe some of the challenges. The positive part for us, for me, definitely has been if you have a sustainable farmer, which we are, we, we, only, we, we weren't a, a dairy farm that sold our milk for profit or anything like that. We did sell some of the milk and we did make yogurt and we sold that. But in essence, that was to try and break even just on our costs that we incurred in feeding the, and looking after the cows. But the real issue is if you're a sustainable farmer and your cow is coming to the end of a milking season and she now has to calve again and you have to dry her up so that she can go into the next season and then she doesn't take when you try to fertilize her, there's a four-month period before you realize that. And now you've only got two cows. Now you've lengthened the time that you are going to have what you would call a dry cow by four months. Then you try again, and again it is not successful, and maybe this time you already knew that the cow was dry, but it takes you about two and a half months before you realize this again. And remember, the gestation period for a cow is much similar to a human. It's not exactly the same, but you can work on nine months. So now you're sitting at more than a year that you are going to be without milk. So it's very important that when you are a small-scale farmer, that when the insemination takes place, that it is successful as you planned it and that you can work forward from there. Because if you don't, then all you're doing is you're feeding an animal and you aren't on a commercial scale. So everything you buy and you invest in this cow is on a small-scale cost, if I can call it that. So you're not buying your feed via some truck that pitches up once a month in bulk. You're actually going to a shop and you're buying bags of feed and you're paying small-scale costs. So everything starts turning against you. And very soon it's almost better to just go and buy milk at the shop and to get rid of the cows. Now, that is where Irene Agricultural College and the insemination that they did on my cows helped me a lot because we had already been dry for about eight months before they came and did the insemination. And during that eight months, we tried various things to get it successfully done. 
and it just never was. So it really was, it was a godsend working with Miss Cindy and his team. I would recommend them to anybody on this call for sure. Thank you so much, um, Valam. And I, I think I can just echo that. I've now known Dr. Masandi for a very short time, but yeah, he's very helpful and very much knowledgeable on this topic and many others, I'm sure. And so we all appreciate them at this point. Elaine, if you will indulge me for a moment, maybe you can just talk more about your experience working with Dr. Masandi and also just more of your research that you've done over this time. When I was doing my research, I was collecting semen from REMS. I was just collecting semen using electro ejaculator, but you can also use artificial vagina after you've trained the REMS. So I was collecting semen using electro ejaculator. Then after that, I analyzed to check the quality of the semen using CASA. I was also doing ostra synchronization for the use, but those used to, were not doing artificial insemination. They were made natural through a REM. That's what I basically did for my research. Okay, great. And I think this was actually one of the questions that came through. I think Dr. Masendi was able to talk to very briefly last week is around the synchronization process. Maybe we can just park there for a moment, Dr. Masendi, and you can maybe just explain this to those that might not know about it, of specifically how it works. And I think there was a question in the comments around what actually gets the cow to go into heat in this way. Thanks. Synchronization is a process whereby you are bringing a large number of cows or females into it or estrus at the same time. So the idea here is because these animals or these females, they are going to show sign of estrus every 21 days in their neural heat. I'm talking to the cattle and pigs here. So every 21 days, they are going to show sign of estrus. So because you won't be in the farm every day to check or to observe which cow is interested to the bull. So the best thing to do to avoid any mistake and delays is to manipulate their hormonal system so that all these cows, they think they are pregnant. So by doing that, it means on the first day, we insert some drug on the vagina of the cow. So that drug contains progesterone hormone. So progesterone hormone is a pregnancy hormone. So it means all those females, they will think they are pregnant, which means tomorrow, day after tomorrow, and next week, they're not going to see any cow looking for the bull or mounting other cow because they think they are all pregnant. So because they think they're all pregnant, now you can able to manipulate and induce as uh, ovulation. So you can know when are they going to uh, start to show sign of stress. Then you can know which day you are going to inseminate because you synchronize the cycle. You terminate the natural cycle. You initiate the new cycle, which will run for plus or minus eight to nine days. So by doing that, it becomes easy. So if they are all 100 cows, you can easily synchronize them all today, day 11, we can come in the same in all 100 cows at the same time, which means all the animals they are going to come in the same week, which makes it easier for you as a farmer to be able to manage and have a plan on how we're going to manage this uh, offspring going forward. So in brief, this is our synchronization on about. Thanks, Dr. Masendi. And then now we want to get into more of the record keeping in terms of artificial insemination. What should you be monitoring um, shortly after it has happened, what should you be monitoring before? Valam, do you want to take this one? Beforehand, and again, I think this is more on Dr. Masindi's side, but beforehand, you should just make sure that the cow is dry and that she is healthy and that she is at the right weight. Essentially, you, I think you should also look at the season because you should work out when the cow is going to calf in nine months' time what feed's going to be available and in the last couple of months before she calves, because she's going to need very good food in order to bear a healthy calf and so on. So beforehand, those are the things that you need to look at. I think afterwards, as a small stock farmer, I'm not a professional, so all I looked for afterwards was if you have more than one cow and you artificially inseminated them, then 23 to 28 days later on, if that was not successful, then the cows would show you by the one showing interest in the other by climbing on them. If that happens, then you know that the cow is ovulating again, so she hasn't taken during the artificial insemination. Then you call your friendly Dr. Masindi and tell him that this has happened. That's basically what I did. 
Thanks, Willem. And maybe I can ask Dr. Masindi also just to comment or respond to the question. What do you do going in? If I'm Farmer Dawn, I have now approached you. What are the preparations that I need to do before when I'm on the farm and monitoring afterwards as well? Thanks. Uh, the moment you contact us and you are asking for uh, this kind of service, so I'll ask you to firstly check or tell me the age, if you know the age of your animals, and also if they are heifers or they never come before, that's why we need the age. But if they once come before, we know they are mature enough, it means they are also cycling uh, uh, properly. Then also after that, we have to check when was the last time they calved. Because we find that uh, most of the farmers, they have a problem that their animals skip a year. They don't calf every year. And then for this program to run successfully, we want animals that are cycling properly, which means the animals that are calving almost every year. Because if you give me animals that maybe seven years old, you can only calf once. Even if I do this technology, it might not work because this animal is not cycling uh, uh, properly. Then we always ask the farmer to be honest and give us reliable animals. So if we get reliable animals, then we can be able to get a better success rate. Then we let me also tell you the issue regarding the body condition score. So you have to make sure that your animals are not too fat or too thin. So we need animals that in average and body condition between three and four on the scale of zero to five. Then after that, we just have to ensure that your head is disease free. If you don't know that, you can ask your local vet to come and check if there's uh, any case of uh, Brussels abortus, because that's the disease that uh, really, really will affect uh, the success of artificial insemination. If that's if not possible, then we can come and uh, do the monitoring and check the infrastructure, check the condition of the animals, then collect the blood we take to the RC uh, on the support within two to three weeks then you can able to know whether your, your head is positive or not. So following insemination, so we'll tell you that after 21 days from today, if you see any cow being mounted and stand firm or mounting others more regularly, you must just know that this one is not pretty much just recorded. So if the day I come to do pregnant diagnosis around day 35, if you already tell me which one and which one, you already know which one pregnant, which one are not by just observing your animals. Then we're going to do previous diagnosis, preferable day 38, and the traditional is done 90 days later, but 90 days later is too late because there's a lot of happening before day 42. We call that embryo loss, so almost around 30 to 35 percent of cows that were that conceived, they tend to lose the embryos at the end of days. But after three months of following insemination, majority of the cows, they are able to maintain pregnancy. That's why you, you will hardly see higher percentages of abortion. But in case where you have a lot of abortion, that's when you know that something's wrong and you have to call your local state vet to come in and uh, evaluate. So record keeping is very, very important because with AI, if we do AI today, we'll be telling you that we're going to come back 35, 35 days later from today, you know when is it. The one that will confirm pregnant, then we can tell you that they are going to come uh, which month or at which week. Then you can easily plan your program yeah, easily. So record keeping yeah, is very, very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Masandi. It's definitely something that we touched on briefly. So I'm glad that you're just putting that point across more clearly and specifically now this time around. Let's talk about um, biosecurity. I think that's something that Fala mentioned in terms of the helping Artificial insemination helping with issues around biosecurity in the beginning, especially as a smallholder farmer. But for example, with the recent outbreak of swine flu, how does it affect, you know, this process of artificial insemination? Um, what is the impact of it? How does it work? How does it impact of, on your research and the, the workings that you're doing with specific farmers as well, Dr. Nasindi? Both of you, if you could respond. You're on a medical grounds now. And it's not my speciality. I'm just I'm just a maplota. So I'm not professional in farming in any way whatsoever. Dr. Masindi, maybe you can take this one. Biosecurity is very, very important in livestock farming. So you have to able to control what is coming in your head and what is going out, especially what are you bringing in your head. So even if, let's say, you want to buy cattle or sheep or goat from your neighbor or whatever, you have to make sure that those animals are disease-free. So biosecurity, that's where it becomes in. So... You have to try all means to avoid bringing animals that you are not sure of uh, regarding their health status because 
you might be bringing that one cow or that sheep or goat and then it will go sexual transmitted disease the male go and mount to that female and then after that your male animal will be spreading that uh, virus or disease uh, in the entire head so if you use artificial insemination the semen that they are using the ai centers i know they have to screen their bulls every three months to make sure that they don't have any diseases because imagine if there's an outbreak on the eye centers people are buying semen straw embryos in numbers and then you go and transfer to your recipient or do the artificial insemination so you'll be spreading that virus or that diseases uh, very very big so basically it can be controlled with the use of artificial insemination but if you are buying the pool you have to just have to make sure that it is well it is screened properly so that it doesn't bring any problem in your head Thank you so much. So the screening and all of this research then gets done at the Agricultural Research Council. All of it is monitored so that none of what you're explaining will ever happen. You want to understand what is it that is done during screening of the animals? Yes, maybe just briefly if you can explain that. In terms of the bulls, if you are buying the bulls from your neighbor or anywhere, so you have to make sure that the sheath wash is done. So what happened, we set the pipe on the sheath of the bull and then take the buffer solution and then rinse it several times and then take the sample to the lab where they're going to check the, for the trichomphalobalta and then trichomonas disease. Those two diseases, they are very, very, they will cause the animal to be infertile, they will cause a lot of abortion in your head. You will find that majority of the animal, they are not pregnant and so forth. So you have to make sure that exercise is done at least two months before breeding season if you are keeping the ball. So you have to do breeding sound evaluation so in case of the semen that you buy from the ai centers elsewhere so those semen or those bulls that donate the semen they are have been vaccinated they also make sure that they are disease free throughout the program so almost every three months they have to make sure that they, they test their their bulls so same apply with the embryos if you are going to buy the embryos so they have to make sure that the donors must be disease free because if not, the tomatoes embryo will be contaminated and then that will be chaos at the end of the day. Like Brucella botas is a state control disease. The government have to do that uh, throughout the country, but we know they sometimes they tend to have some challenges. Of course, they try to, to cover a large number of animals as much as possible. Thanks so much for, for that clarity, Dr. Masendi. And I think I've covered most of what I wanted to touch on as follow-ups from our previous sessions. In the meantime, I'm going to ask maybe all of our speakers just to add one final comment in closing as we wrap up. I'm going to start with you, Elaine. Elena, you can maybe just share one final message. Yeah, I just want to thank, to thank other speakers for sharing with us the information. Even me as an animal scientist, there are other things that I've learned today that I didn't know. So I just want to thank them for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Venom, something from your side? I'd just like to say, look, if you're, uh, and I am a small scale farmer, so commercial farmers, obviously, everything always comes down to that and sent for them. But I think that's the biggest thing that as a small scale farmer, one also has to control because your input costs are higher per unit than when you're a commercial farmer. So one really needs to work quite hard to keep the costs down. And that's why it's so important to do everything after you've weighed up all your options, looked at all your options, and then take the right way forward. So thank you for the opportunity to join us. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you so much for sharing your insights. Dr. Masindi, you have the last word, sir. And I know that there's so much more to share, but for me, I think we've covered so much. And Maybe just last and final comments and then how people can get in touch with you. As a livestock farmer, either being small scale farmer, imagine or commercial farmers, I think we have to take advantage of these uh, assisted reproduction technologies so that we can be able to improve, have a good quality breed uh, as much as possible and able to maintain and grow our production and able to provide. Uh, more products or food for the whole country and the world in general. So let's utilize these technologies. They are there for us to use them. If you need more clarity, you can contact us at Agriculture Council. We can be able to assist where we can. 
and then we're always available to assist you guys. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Masindi, and thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you so much, Willem. It has been a great evening, and I really enjoy talking to you and sharing you know, some of the knowledge from the speakers. So I'm looking forward to, again, maybe having them back. You do know that all of these sessions are available on Food Forms Anzi's YouTube channel if you've missed any part of it. And maybe you also want to get a recap of the first part that we did last week that is available on Food Forms Anzi's Twitter um, account, but more so it will be available later on our YouTube channel as well. Um, once again, thank you so much to all of my speakers. And to all of you, all the best with your farming journey and all your work that you do within the agricultural sector. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening. Bye-bye for now.